Hello all. The following video is for the purposes of revision, with the aim of presenting a brief recap of the poem, some analysis, some of the questions raised by the poem, and potential links with other poems in the anthology. As always, nothing in this video will be more important than your own reflections on the poem. To the recap. In this brief 16-line poem, made up of four quatrains, Two people, whom I shall refer to as the couple, are walking on a glorious day in late autumn, when suddenly a snake crosses their path. The snake is not threatening them, but tracking its prey, which we never see. The couple observe the snake closely, mesmerised by its presence, before it finally disappears, and they walk on in silence. Analysis to begin with, then, the title. Not simply a snake, but a hunting snake, we're immediately faced with a ruthless, deadly, predatory vision of the animal. In the Christian world, the image of the snake is also associated with evil and corruption, as portrayed in the story of the Garden of Eden, which also features a beautiful landscape, two people, and a snake. The reason I suggest this partly theological interpretation, is also because of the use of the word grace in the first line of the poem, which suggests a link to the divine. And indeed, the opening of the poem does offer a rather Eden-like scene. Together with the image of the sun, there is also the abundant use of sibilance in sun warmed in this late season's grace, as well as assonance providing an internal half-rhyme in late and grace. So the soft, melodious sounds of that first line reflect the sense of calm and tranquility in the scene, which is then again emphasised with the image of the gentlest sky. The use of enjambment in the first two lines also adds to this sense of relaxation, with the unbroken lines evoking the easy rhythm of the couple's walk. So far, it's a peaceful scene with two people enjoying the beauty and warmth of the sun below a benevolent sky. And then comes the first break in the poem, with the sejura in line three, a poetic break which mirrors the disruptive entrance of the snake, the pause in the poetry also reflecting the sudden stop of the couple. The tranquility is gone and the powerful presence of the snake is seen in the rhythmic stress placed on each word in the description of the great black snake. The adjectives great and black perhaps refer to the size and colour of the snake, but they also hint at something of power, a dark force that commands our attention as it does theirs. For the next two stanzas, they stand frozen and watching the snake, as though it had a kind of hypnotic hold upon them. And the descriptions of the snake also suggest a level of ambiguity. It is not simply dark and deadly, though it is those things. The first sign of this ambiguity can be seen in the use of the word quested. A quest is perhaps typically associated with medieval knights venturing on perilous but virtuous journeys. And the words he quested lend an element of grandeur and purpose to the hunt. The use of sibilance in sun glazed his curves of diamond scale perhaps evokes the hissing sound of his tongue flickering and his stealthy movement through the grass. A diamond something cold, hard, and beautiful, is another ambiguous image, which suggests that this dark and deadly creature also has something mesmerising and majestic in its movement. The couple remain transfixed, their breath literally taken away in the final line of the stanza. In the third stanza, the enthralling presence of the snake banishes all thought of its prey, 
the couple don't think about whatever poor creature is about to be killed, because the spectacle of the great black snake itself is simply too entrancing. So it is not the fate of the victim, but the force of the hunter that captivates the couple. Herein lies the ambiguity of the poem. Aside from natural feelings of fear and perhaps repulsion towards such a deadly creature, there is also a certain curiosity and mysterious attraction towards this great black force. That fierce intent is brutal and deadly, but there is also something entrancing in that singular purpose, the power of an unstoppable force ruthlessly pursuing its object. As the last line of stanza three shows, the couple literally cannot take their eyes off him. Is such a force of destruction something that both repels and fascinates us? The first line of the final stanza again captures that ambiguity. The first two adjectives, cold and dark evoke the cold-blooded, brutal, inhumane nature of the snake, but the third, splendid, suggests elegance and beauty. As the snake disappears, the couple finally take a deeper breath and return to the beautiful day that seemed to disappear throughout the middle of the poem. They look at each other, but say nothing. As well as that pregnant silence, there is the suggestion that some kind of change has taken place. And this is seen through the change in the rhyme scheme in the final stanza. The first three have followed an A-B-A-B pattern. The last stanza, however, moves to A-B-B-A, which I would suggest is less open and more insular than the previous structure, perhaps like the couple themselves, now somewhat preoccupied, their previous tranquility shaken, both now more introverted as they walk on in silence after witnessing the snake. The idealistic vision of those opening lines, with the warm sun and gentle sky, is destroyed, and while the snake may have disappeared, in some sense, his presence remains, as seen through the change in rhyme. And now some questions to consider. Might there be any significance in the time period of the poem, late autumn, with winter soon to follow? Can interaction with animals and nature shape our understanding or perspective of the world and of ourselves? If we consider the snake to be an analogy for brutal animal instinct, then what is our relationship with that instinct? Why are we fascinated by it? Does it exist within us? Drawing on the potential for theological interpretations, remembering the close links between the poem and the biblical story of the Garden of Eden, how do we accommodate the darker forces in our world? And what is our relationship with those forces? It might also be important to remember that the Australian author, Judith Wright, was a passionate advocate of the Aboriginal land rights movement and of conservation in general. So is this poem more about the observation, appreciation and calm acceptance of the snake rather than the troubled contemplation we have been exploring. And finally, some links to other poems in the anthology. With close observation of the snake, this poem invites us to explore our relationship with nature and the environment. Using animals as a way of exploring man's relationship both with nature and himself is also seen in the cockroach, where the speaker ultimately sees the cockroach and its movements as a reflection of his own position in the world. In pike and horses, animals again offer a mesmerising presence, which shakes the perspective of the author 
and invites the reader to consider his relationship with nature. In the poems mentioned so far, nature is seen as a darker, deadlier, more powerful force than the more traditional, marginally romantic perspective on nature, found in poems such as Pied Beauty, Where I Come From, and Summer Farm, where nature offers tranquility, creativity, spontaneity, and a refuge from the dangers of urban life. That's all for now. If you have found the video useful, then please subscribe for more Poetry Revision with Mr Brooker.